My name is Lee Beers. I'm from Trumbull County. Um, if you hit Pennsylvania, you come back 10 miles, and that's, that's Trumbull County. Um, so northeastern Ohio has a pretty rich history of trying out different crops. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges you can expect to face when you come into a quote-unquote new crop for your area. Um, so we're going to talk about some, some less, lessons learned. In the last two years, I've been getting a lot of questions about different crops. Somebody said, well, what about sunflowers and a canola and all these different things? So the question is, what is really driving this interest? Crop prices, right? When you're getting 330 corn and 750 beans, there's a lot of interest in diversification, getting some different crops to provide an income to your farm. And there's a lot of niche markets out there. So ancient grains, how many of you have heard ancient grains like quinoa? Um, there's a lot of market demand for these different products. Curtis was talking about dog food. The pet food industry is driving, specifically what I'm gonna talk about today, field peas. Differences in how many of you have seen grain-free dog food varieties, right? So they're trying to replace that grain with something else, and a lot of that is coming in the form of legumes. So there's a lot of stuff that's driving this. And I'm gonna be talking about specialty crops, Let's just throw out there anything you're doing different than what you've done in the past. So it can be organic, non-GMO, GMO, anything you're doing, something new, the process will be the same for helping you get through that um, process. Weather patterns. Did anybody hear Aaron Wilson talk about climate and what to expect for 2019? It's going to be wet. Some of the crops that we have, or maybe some of your areas, don't do so well for your crops you're growing now, so maybe diversifying that way. But the bottom line is it's all down to money. You want to be profitable for your farm so it's sustainable for the future and you have a, a steady income despite what corn, soybeans, or some of your standard um, uh, crops will be doing. So when a specialty or new crop comes in, it's really a challenge to find information. All right. So where do you find information? A lot of times in the case of field peas or when we're talking about industrial hemp, They've been grown before in Ohio, right? It's just been a very, very long time since we've actually grown those. And the information that we have, it's historical from the early 1900s. So the information is there, but then we have to ask ourselves, is that still relevant? A lot has changed in the last 100 years. Different varieties, different cultivars, different practices, different tools, different equipment. Or sometimes that information was just lost. Uh, I know field peas are grown in Ohio. I looked through all the bulletins of the Ohio Ag Research Station. I found mention of it, but no actual research of agronomic practices and things that would be useful. Most likely that crop has grown somewhere. So is it the prairie states? Is it Canada? Is it Kentucky? If it's grown somewhere, somebody has probably written something about it. So you go to that region, and then you ask yourself again, is that information relevant? If I'm going to be growing a, a, a tropical crop in Ohio, this information I find from Costa Rica that relevant. So it's really questioning about, is this the most relevant resource? And parsing out the pieces that you find useful versus the things that you may want to explore a little bit differently. Market availability. So somebody comes in and says, can I grow sunflowers? I'm, like, I'm sure you can. Can you sell them? Same with canola. So, and even with the dog food, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Market variability with some of these specialty crops, it goes up and down. How many of you uh, grew buckwheat in the 80s? Anybody? Buckwheat was huge in the 80s in northeastern Ohio. People, they grew it, they got a good price for it, and then all of a sudden the interest in buckwheat pancakes dropped off as a health food. Next thing you know, they have all this buckwheat seed that you can't do anything with, and that market has dried up. So in Ohio, uh, here's field peas. Field peas look just like your regular garden peas. Does anybody know what this is? This is miscanthus. There are several thousand acres in northeastern Ohio of this grown. It's harvested just like corn silage. They come in with a chopper, and then they take all of that and they send it off for biofuel, um, either as an absorbent, biofuel production, or if you get a compostable container at Chipotle, it's made of something similar to this. So these two have come into northeastern Ohio in the last five to six years, pretty heavily. But if we look on the, even more historically, hops. How many of you have hops growing in your county or regionally? 
20 years ago, this was a specialty crop. We've come a long way, but can you imagine if you were the first person in Ohio to grow hops in the last 50 years? There is quite a steep learning curve going on there. Industrial hemp. This has been in the news a lot with the latest farm bill. It's still illegal in Ohio. Research has been going on in Kentucky and Canada for several years now, and they are facing the same problems. And when it comes to Ohio, we're going to be behind the ball. All right, so I'm going to use field peas as a case study or an example of the things that we learned going through the process. When I say we, I mean the farmers in collaboration with Extension. So a little bit of background. In 2017, there was an opportunity with a feed mill, not feed mill, I'm sorry, a dog food production facility in Meadville, Pennsylvania, just across the border. It's Ainsworth Dog Food, which is now owned by Smuckers. They were looking for a local source of field peas that they can include into their dog food variety because they were shipping in rail cars full from the prairie states, but sometimes there would be a delay somewhere along the line, and they're looking for a local source to fill in those gaps. So they contracted with a local elevator. The elevator negotiated the price, and they came with a pretty, pretty solid guaranteed $11.25 a bushel for field peas. It's not bad. So several hundred acres were planted in northeastern Ohio with very little planning, very little um, time given to actually do some research because by the time that they said, hey, we're going to grow field peas, the time you had to place your seed order was just a couple of weeks. So there, it was really, really quick turnaround. And in some cases, there was a very steep learning curve and a very costly learning curve. Um, one field, I'll show you an example. They had zero bushels per acre when they harvested it. Okay. So what are field peas? Again, they're the same as your garden peas. How many of you have grown snow peas or something in your garden? Right. Same thing. They're just a little different. Okay. They're, they grow the same way. They're very viney. If you stake up your peas in your garden, you know that they kind of go up. If you plant them in a, a giant field, they form this giant mat. And you try to walk through it, it is... It's a workout. So if you're ever looking for a workout, go to North Dakota and walk through a field, pea, uh, field for several acres. It's a cool season annual crop. <clears throat> so just like you'd think of oats, you'd be planting these in early spring, um, about the same time you want to be planting oats. Uh, they can be separated into several categories, green or yellow, um, spring or winter. Uh, we planted spring um, peas. If you think of Austrian peas, same thing. Uh, you just plant them in the winter and they, they survive over the winter. They can be determinate or indeterminate. And all the varieties we planted were green, spring, and indeterminate. And they're harvested as grain, but I'll talk a little bit about, you're probably more familiar with them as a cover crop or as a forage plant. So production in North America, you can see the production historically. Well, this isn't historically, but this is 2016 where most of the production is. You can, all the prairie states. So it's going to be Montana, North Dakota, and then if you extend this up into Canada, you'll see it's in Saskatchewan all the way up there. We've been growing field peas for a long time in North America, all the way back to the 1800s. <coughs> but they're grown widely as a cover crop and forage. That's probably what, as I already mentioned, you're probably more familiar with. So as a forage crop, they're very, very valuable. If you get the, the, the grain, it has an energy level similar to corn. And if you're looking for an option to put in to, to get a forage crop off, they're good for winter killed alfalfa. They come up easy, um, and you can graze them as you need it. A lot of people plant them with oats and barley or triticale to get some more tonnage out of it. Um, but it is a legume, so it can provide some nitrogen. And light tillage, if you have some, after you graze it, you can actually promote a second growth. Not such a good idea in Ohio, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. But what I'm going to be talking about is field pea as a grain crop, <clears throat> because that's why it was planted northeastern Ohio. That's what the market was, um, and that's what most of the American acreage is, is dedicated to. Right? Extensive use in the pet food industry. Next time you are in the pet food aisle, you're buying pet food, whether it's for your cat or dog, look at the ingredients. I can almost guarantee it somewhere on there it says pea. That's what we're talking about. So dried peas, you, you pick it, it looks just like, well, there's a picture of it, just like peas. 
um, if you have favorable conditions, you can get two harvests off the same plot of land every year. You plant them in March, and in Ohio, we typically took them off sometime between the first and second week of July. That gave you enough time to plant them immediately afterwards for harvest in September, October. Um, that second harvest was just wasting fuel, uh, but you can get two crops off of them. So the field pea opportunity was here. Now what do we do? All right, they said, we have this opportunity to grow peas. What's the first thing we need to do? Just like you're probably sitting in your combine or your truck, you probably had a call from your seed salesman last fall trying to pick out your cultivars and your varieties for this coming year. That's where it starts. Um, you know, you want to look at your disease ratings, your days to maturity, just like you would with any other crop. And most importantly in this case, what does the pet food industry want? They were very specific on they wanted green and they wanted it harvested and in their bins by August. So that really limited what was available. Okay. As you can imagine, Ohio State does not have a fact sheet on field pea production. So when a local farmer called and said, hey, I need to ask you some questions about what variety to plant. So the, the contractor or the elevator that had the contract I mentioned earlier, they gave every farmer a list of seven or eight cultivars to choose from. It was on a photocopy piece of paper, very, very sparse information. So I took that information and said, give me a little bit. Can I have a day or two? He's like, well, I need to know to put in the order tomorrow. So I went out and I started looking for field trials and cultivar information I could find. And I came up with North Dakota, University of Maine, surprisingly, uh, Minnesota, and a lot of information from the Can Canadian prov provinces. Can't talk this late in the day. Now, these are cold states and provinces. So northern Ohio, we're not that cold. But we looked at what is the disease rating for these cultivars. Because in the, thought, in the back of our mind, everything you read about field peas, they'll be decimated by powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is the number one pest that will wipe out a crop. So we went straight to what is going to be our best disease rated cultivar and kind of worked our way backwards from there. And we came down to two, Coda and Admirable, Admir Admiral, sorry, I can't talk. And then we chose those two, several other farmers went with a couple other varieties. Um, but timing was very important in this situation. We had a very short turnaround between, hey, we have this guaranteed price, here's all the information you need, we need your seed orders pretty much right now. Okay. And then we started all the questions of, okay, how do we put it in the ground and how do we grow it? Right? If you farm or if you work with farmers, you know we can grow anything. Can we do it the best way possible? That was the hard part. You know, we can grow field peas. Now, is it going to be 100% yield potential? Or are we talking about 50%? And that's where we started getting into some trouble. So row spacing. In northeastern Ohio, we have a huge problem with white mold. Same white mold that will infect soybeans will infect field peas. A lot of farmers went to 30 inch rows and 15 inch rows of soybeans to prevent disease. All the published reports were six to 18 inch spacing. Wider spacing has less disease potential, but now you have peas that grow up and then they fall over because they don't have that mutual support from the other vines. So, Farmers, they say, well, I'm going to put out 11 acres. I'm not going to mess with the row spacing. They put it in a drill, and most of them are on seven-inch rows. Okay? And then plant populations. All right, so I'm going to put it through the drill. Now what is my spacing, or my plant population? Get it too high. Again, you get in that disease pressure. Most farmers want for that 300 to 320,000 seeds per acre. Okay? Um, inoculant. This is something that kind of came back to haunt us a little bit later. Field peas, because just like think soybeans 30 years ago for a field that's never grown soybeans, you have to put inoculant in. We followed the recommended rate. The recommended rate was for fields that have been growing field peas for many, many years. So I'll show you a picture here. Ann Dorrance came out. It was, I think, the third week of June. We're pulling out plants. They were not nodulated. So there are no nodules. So the rate... 
even though we followed the published recommended rate, needed to be doubled. Okay. Timing. So it's a cold crop, but how early should you plant? Okay. So is it? Are we talking March fifteenth? As soon as we can get in that field, that's what we're putting in. You know, fertilizer. What are the fertilizer requirements? Every part of the research says it's a legume. It doesn't need much fertilizer. But if you need to, you can put down 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen. Most farmers said, well, it's a legume. Soybeans don't need nitrogen, so I'm not going to put down nitrogen. Okay. Field selection. This was huge. Absolutely huge. We didn't know about it beforehand. Do we want a wet field, a dry field, sand or clay? Sand or clay didn't make a bit of difference. The wet or dry and compacted, I should have put compacted in there, made a huge difference. Compacted wet soils, because 2018 was a desert in Ohio, right? We had a lot of problems with waterlogged fields, and peas do not like waterlogged compacted soils. I can look down. I don't have a very good picture of it today, but I do have a picture. I can look down a field, pea field, and I can see the tracks from the grain cart from the prior harvest. It was that noticeable. And, you know, there's a double crop opportunity. If I can get twice the yield off of the same field, hey, why not try it, right? So there was a few farms that tried this. Another couple of farms, they put in some, some cover crops and just kind of left it go. Disease control. Here's powdery mildew. You all know what powdery mildew looks like. And because this was a new crop, I've actually had a couple of farmers call me in May saying, I have this white stuff on my field peas. I'm going to spray with fungicide. I went out and looked at it. Do you know how when you look at a pea plant, it has that waxy material on it? That's what it was. But they're applying fungicide to treat a natural bloom that's on that waxy surface. So right there, your profit per acre just went down. If we look at powdery mildew coming through northeastern Ohio, historically, we're talking mid to late July. It's never there in, in May. It's just It doesn't have that time to get up to speed and start going forward. So timing of fungicide was huge. And I'm going to skip ahead here. The chemistries that were available that had field peas on the label, finding those was very, very difficult. It's not like soybeans or corn where you just go to the dealer and you buy something. We were limited in one or two fungicides, and predominantly it was approach. Insect control. So that's corn earworm going inside that pod, eating all of the peas out of it. This picture was three days after an off-label application of Warrior. So that, I'll show you another picture. They decimated a field on top of powdery mildew. We also had aphids, which I don't have a picture of this, but just below this on the soil surface, it was just dead aphids everywhere from the Warrior, along with lady beetles and every other um, positive control. Tarnished plant bug was a big one that we didn't expect to see. Weeds were not such an issue. There was a surprising number of herbicides that have P labeled on it. So we actually had pretty good weed control. But because these came off in July, there wasn't a lot of weed pressure that had a chance to get up um, going forward. So here's corn earworm. Here, here. If you look in the background, anytime you see a little brown thing, um, it was absolutely loaded. And this, again, two days after an application of Warrior. Or, or a generic version of Warrior. What time of year was that? This is going to, this is actually in double crops. This is double crop, this is going to be in September. Okay? So this is also the same field. So you can see all that brown material. It's powdery mildew coupled with corn earworm. Okay? And if we take a look at the whole field, from a distance, like what do you call it, 50-50? 50 miles an hour, 50 feet away. Doesn't look terrible. You get up inside. Oh, sorry. Let's back up here. This is the field that had zero bushels of the acre. They went through and they went, ah, it's disappearing on me. There's nothing there. Between the disease and the corn earworm, it just decimated that whole field. And I do have a picture. It's not the greatest. This is a different field. This is first crop. It's not showing up very well here. But can you sort of see this low spot right here? 
That's a low spot after a heavy rainstorm. And this edge of the wood line is where they ran the grain cart. 15 bushels the acre versus 35 farther towards the center. And you could, I'm not joking, you could literally see where the tracks from the grain cart were the previous year. So there's quite a bit of learning curve. Um, and I'll talk about this in a minute too. And then harvest also had some, some challenges as well. So because they're indeterminate, you had to have a harvest aid. So what is recommended, <clears throat> what's on the label, uh, glyphosate or paraquat. We had farmers use both. Glyphosate took five to seven days to get uniform dry down. Paraquat was two. So farmers who were planning on harvesting a little more uniformly, and they went with glyphosate, they had to wait. Next thing you know, you had field peas sitting out there, and field peas that sit are very, very brittle, and you bump them, and you lose yield. <coughs> so paraquat has its advantages. Draper heads, of all things. If you harvest these like you do your soybeans with the draper head, you get tumbleweeds that just tumble on the belts, and they wrap. So a conventional head were much preferred. So mid-July harvest in Trumbull County, here you can see that's a conventional head. Yields were averaging 30 to 35 bushels. Okay. If we look back at what did we lose, I think we probably lost 10 bushels the acre based on inoculation and the potential of those varieties based on published research. <coughs> so this was trial by fire. So what did we learn? We learned a lot. A lot. I can't even list everything that we've learned. But of all of the things that we learned the most about, cultivar and field selection were the greatest or the largest indicators of success for field peas. If you had low-lying, compacted fields, you're probably losing 20 bushels. If you had upland, well-drained, tiled ground, in 2018 anyways, you had a pretty good success. Double crop peas were bad. We're putting them in the ground right as the time powdery mildew is getting up the speed. That picture with all that corn earworm, they took off the beans, and when the beans started to dry down, they all, that corn earworm came from somewhere. It wasn't in the beans, it wasn't in the corn, but they showed up and just decimated that. I think that was a 40-acre field. That 40 acres was gone. Uh, inoculate levels were too low, I already mentioned. The fungicide timing, uh, the whole early crop, their first crop, they probably could have skipped 90% of all their fungicide applications of some of the farmers. One application about probably two to three weeks prior to harvest, and you would hit that window. Anything before that, and you're just wasting your money and you're losing profitability. So insect issues were more prevalent, but it was a profitable crop from farmers who actually were able to harvest something in 2018. But the list goes on and on and on about the things that we learned. So hindsight is 2020. If we could do something different or make recommendations, here they are. It doesn't matter if it's field peas, hemp, miscanthus, organic industry, whatever. These are recommendations I can make across the board that we've learned from miscanthus, field peas, and just everything else in northeastern Ohio. Involve university resources as quickly as possible. We did not get a phone call until 2018 because some of the farmers who tried it in 2017 had a bad time or bad go of it. Okay? So getting university or professional resources involved at the beginning, extension, specialist, economist, is, is I cannot stress that enough. We had the endurance come out. She said, oh, I worked on field pieces in my graduate school. I'm like, oh, okay. So we actually have a local resource that has some familiarity with that. And for farmers, dedicate a percentage of acreage to research trials or research plots. I think if we had farmers put in two acres of different cultivars and see how they respond to their environment, going forward we would have a lot more information and their yields would go up drastically. Pesticide trials, fungicide timing trials, and see how things work out. And do not underestimate the value of talking to other farmers. I think we all know that. Get them all in a room. Get all the farmers in a room. Say, hey, what did you learn? I screwed up. I did this. I screwed up. I did this. Learn from each other's mistakes. Actually getting them in a room to talk um, was able to identify a lot of issues about cultivars that worked, cultivars that did not work. Take some time to do some research. If you have the time, we had a very short turnaround for field peas. Do as much research as you possibly can. 
the difference between a disease resistant rating and cultivar was 35 bushels the acre versus zero. So that one field with all the corn earworm and the powdery mildew, that variety is called spider. The other ones that actually had a pretty good yield were coda and admirable. Admiral, not admirable. Um, plan ahead if you can. As far ahead as you can get, get some research, find out what you can. So here's Ann Doran. She actually out there looking at a local farmer, uh, looking at the lack of nodulation and looking for the sclerotinia in the stems. And I need to stress this. Moderate your resources. Don't go whole hog. Field peas are not in Trumbull County this year. That contract, because that pet food plant was sold, they probably aren't going to be buying locally. So if you do not have the tools or equipment to invest in this crop, you may be leaving some money on the table in the short term, but in the long term, you may be hurting yourself financially. So make sure that there is a, a ready and sustained market before you jump in, so start small.